for you at home. They want to reframe uh, universal uh, kindergarten or universal pre-K as a way of, hey, this is child care. This will save you money at home. You're worried about high prices. We're going to cut the cost of prescription drugs. So they're trying to take the most popular pieces of their larger domestic agenda and make the case that they are also help and in fight inflation. Now, that's the question, Tom. Is the public ready to embrace or listen to that? I don't know. And that's why I think this is such an opportunity for the president tonight. On the international front, you have an audience curious to what he has to say. If he, if he is able to win credibility on his leadership on the international front, it might open the door to get more of the public to buy in to his prescriptions on the domestic front. Chuck Todd for us tonight. Chuck, we look forward to all of your coverage. I know it's going to be a busy night for you. And a reminder, our NBC News Now State of the Union coverage is coming up in just a moment with Hallie Jackson. Lester and Savannah anchor President Biden's address at 9. And then Chuck and Kristen Welker with the post-speech show and analysis. It is a very big night for this network. We want to thank you so much for watching this special edition of Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in Ukraine tonight. Stay right there. Hallie's coming up right now, kicking off our State of the Union show right now. President of the United States. President Joe Biden tonight delivering his first official State of the Union. My fellow Americans. Speaking to the biggest invited thank crowd you, at the Capitol you. since the start of the pandemic. The president's words coming at a critical time. His presidency faced with the most significant invasion in Europe in decades. And there's no question that Russia is the aggression. And then there's the economy, with consumer sentiment hitting its lowest level in a decade, with inflation on the rise. Average people are getting clobbered by the cost of everything today. All of it, as the president and his team hope to put the pandemic in the rearview mirror. We're moving toward a time when COVID-19 won't disrupt our daily lives. So how will President Biden describe our State of the Union? It's never, ever, ever been a good bet to bet against America, and it still isn't. From NBC News Now, a presidential State of the Union, live from Washington, here's Hallie Jackson. Hey, I'm Hallie, and listen, this is a big night for President Biden. We've got your back as we get ready for all of it, with the four key things to watch as he makes his case to all of us in prime time. And you know we're starting with Ukraine and the situation with Russia, the possibility of this split-screen moment there, and the president's message that Vladimir Putin was wrong and the U.S. and its allies will not be divided. Then here at home, watch for the president to lay out his plan for the economy. You've got unemployment that's down, but inflation is up. So listen for how he talks about that and what he's going to try to do to get inflation under control. What is under control, the president says, is the pandemic. That's another key theme in this speech tonight. And an interesting optical moment here, his audience, Congress, they'll be mask optional for the first time in months. And then there's this other kind of hard to define vibe we're going to hear about unity. So what does that look like in a Congress that's divided on his agenda, especially on the climate and infrastructure? Get ready to hear a lot more about building a better America tonight. That is the theme du jour. And keep in mind the political backdrop to all of this. The president has approval ratings that are below 40 percent right now. It's not the trajectory the White House wants to see tonight. Again, a lot at stake as the president makes his case to millions of people. We will have our team everywhere. You're going to see this control room wall live. This is what we see live in our control room. We're going to have it up all night long because for the next 60 minutes, we will be telling you everything that's going down as the president gets ready for his speech. And as we showed you, the best reporters in the business to talk about all of these topics that we just mentioned from the Capitol to the White House overseas in Ukraine. Senator Mark Warner, chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, will be with us, too. You know there's plenty of headlines on that front. We also have our Republican and Democratic insiders with us for their perspective on what President Biden needs to do. And then, of course, on the set with me, our friends for the next 60 minutes, Yamish Alcindor, Anna Palmer, Jeremy Bash. We're glad to be with all of you, and we're glad to be with you for our special State of the Union coverage right here on NBC News Now. Let's get to it. Let's get to Kelly O'Donnell, who's over near the White House. And Kelly, we are now getting a sense of what the president is going to say. We're getting some early excerpts specifically about Russia and Ukraine. Bring us up to speed. 
Well, Hallie, as you know, the State of the Union is typically a blueprint for a year's worth of work for an administration. This takes on a very different tone with abrupt changes made to what the president is saying because of the urgency of the moment, with foreign policy taking at least the initial uh, center stage for President Biden, where he will make a very severe rebuke of Vladimir Putin and his unprovoked war. He'll also set some policy, things that we've just learned, like, for example, the president will say that the United States will close its airspace to Russian aircraft. That's another step that can be a penalty to not only Vladimir Putin, but the elites of Russia who may be trying to escape with their money or their families to try to get away from the collapsing economy in Russia that is a product of the kind of sanctions and economic penalties that the president's uh, work along with allies has brought to bear. You'll hear from the president a real focus on the unity among European and allies that go beyond that, NATO partners, of course, but even allies in other parts of the globe, where the president has tried to keep that uh, alliance uh, tight on the same page when at times that was difficult, and trying to deal with fast-changing developments for how to supply, support, and aid the Ukrainian people in what is a changing and dire situation on the ground in Ukraine, and at the same time trying to send a message that does not escalate the unpredictable nature of Vladimir Putin, who has already threatened the use of nuclear weapons by hinting at his arsenal. His unpredictability, one of the factors that the White House is trying to do its best to not escalate or in some way provoke. So that is the piece that the president has needed to add. And on top of that, the president has his own domestic agenda that That's he right. wants to work through. And of course, there are times when what is happening at home is very much intertwined with the United States' place in the world. And that's part of what we'll see tonight, Hallie. Kelly O'Donnell live for us there at the White House. So, Kelly, I know at some point we're going to see the president leaving the White House to head down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Hill. I know you'll be close to a camera for us on that front. We're watching it, of course, in our control room while here. One of the things that Kelly talked about is the importance of what's happening with Ukraine and with Russia. We know the president's been reworking his speech to hit that point on allies, right? And just as we were coming on the air, I want to bring in Tom Yamas, who's live in Ukraine. Tom, we found out that news that Kelly just reported on the U.S. The president's expected to announce closing its airspace to Russia. You are there. You are on the ground where there is, frankly, a growing humanitarian crisis. This is a foreign policy crisis the president has to address and is planning to address tonight. There's no doubt. I mean, we're talking about nearly 700,000 refugees. And I can tell you from being at the border, from being at these train stations, those numbers are only going to get higher and higher as the days of this war stretch on. People here are going to want to hear from President Biden that they're going to help. There are things that President Biden can do, and there are things that President Biden cannot do. People here in Ukraine, they want the U.S., they want the NATO to get involved. NATO, I should say, to get involved. They want NATO to enforce a no-fly zone. That's likely not going to happen. We heard that from the U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson today. We've heard that from President Biden. They know as soon as any type of NATO troop takes on a Russian troop, this could launch and could start World War III. So that's likely not going to happen. We're not going to hear that from President Biden. But we can hear that more weapons are going to be coming Ukraine's way. More aid is going to be coming to Ukraine's way. More sanctions are going to be going towards Russia. As for those families that are leaving, what they're going to want to hear, if, if they are even addressed, is that they are going to be accepted into these European countries that border Ukraine. You know, historically, Europe has had some very, very tough immigration laws. Some of the bordering countries have relaxed those immigration laws as waves of refugees pour in now. And so they're going to want help. And, Hallie, when you talk to these families, I mean, they're in tears. A lot of them are just mothers carrying their children, carrying their babies. They're not sure what they're coming back to. They're not sure if they're going to be able to come back at all. The people who are still Staying here. You know, when, when you think that, that groups of civilians are going to take on Russian tanks with Molotov cocktails, 
it is admirable. It is courageous. It's something that I don't know if a lot of other people across the world would do, but it just gives you a reality check of what these people are up against. Yeah. It is the early days of this war. The Ukrainians have been so courageous, so valiant. Hallie, we, we all know that, but it is still very early, and we have not seen the full force of Russia's military just yet. It's such a good point, Tom, and it's such a good gut check, right? I mean, it's not like the majority of Ukrainian people who are looking to get to safety for fear of their lives are going to be watching President Biden's State of the Union. To be honest, as you know, TV towers in the capital of Kyiv, you know, hit by a Russian airstrike, right? It's not like they even yeah. have TV in the first place. So it's important context. We're glad you're there on the ground. Thank you. We want to stay on this topic because, listen, it is the big one tonight, the fact that Russia is escalating in Ukraine. And despite the fact that U.S. military officials and defense officials have suggested perhaps Russia is stalled at the moment, as you heard Tom allude to, it may not last that long. What else does the U.S. intelligence community know so far? With me now is the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. I know from your office before you have to sprint over to the chamber for the speech, so we appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, Hallie. Let me start on that front, Ukrainian resistance. Based on your assessment and what you've heard, and I know you're not going to reveal classified information. I'm not asking you to do that. How long do you expect this Ukrainian They're having the Monster Club initiation meeting. I really, really, really want to be a member. Being driven in the Monster Mobile. Girls swooning all over me. And wearing the coolest jacket. Being a member of the Monster Club will be my crowning achievement. The icing on my cake. Whether you get in or not, you'll always be our little monster. We're looking for the few, the proud, the monster. Thanks for coming with me. Hmm. I just hope nobody recognizes me. <laughs> To prove you're worthy of becoming a monster, you must perform three awesome tricks that will culminate in the Monster Mash Halloween night. Well then, when are they serving the cookies? Shh, Theodore. Monsters aren't born, they're created. Hit the deck! It's the pumpkin head. The new kid, half boy, half pumpkin. He was born one Halloween night in a pumpkin patch. He died three times, coming back each time grosser than before. 
Yeah, he just looks at you and your hair falls out. He just breathes on you and you get spots all over your body. Yeah, you just get near him and your, um, head shrivels, squeezing your brains all over the place. And then you, um, explode into a gajillion pieces. It's amazing how much you know about someone you never met. Alvin, when are they serving those cookies? Those of you who prove worthy of monsterhood will get to wear this. I want it. I want it. I want it. Simon, do you think this is a good enough trick for the monsters? Alvin, have you seen my new pair of blue socks? Oh, sure. Whenever anyone can. Find anything, it's always my fault. Alvin! Well, if you would help me, this stuff wouldn't keep happening. Oh, you know how I feel about that club. Look, Alvin, people do things in groups they wouldn't consider doing alone. Cut the sermon, Simon. I'm gonna get in that club with you or without you. <laughs> Are you gonna help me or not? All right, I'll do it. But it's gonna cost you. Thank <laughs> you. 